All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Center for Global Enterprise, Global Scholars, Expert Series, Identity in a Digital World. My name is Ira Sager. I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise, or CGE. For those of you that are new to CGE and our Global Scholars Program, let me explain our mission. CGE is a nonprofit research institute focused on the study of global management best practices, the modern corporation, economic integration, and their impact on society. Our Global Scholars Program is a worldwide learning community for business interested students, academic faculty, and business professionals. Through the Global Scholars Program, we offer online courses and digital internships, as well as this and other Expert Connect webinar series. Participation in all our programs and membership is free. You can find out more information about CG and our activities of the Global Scholars Program on our website. Uh, before we start today's program, a few housekeeping notes. We will be recording uh, this program and it will be available on demand from our YouTube channel. <clears throat> we'll leave approximately 15 minutes at the end of uh, this session for audience questions. If you have a question for our panelists at any time during the presentation, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll try to get to all your questions, time permitting. In our last forum, we explored India's ADHAR program, the first and largest digital identity system implemented on a national scale. For today's forum, Better Identity in America, a blueprint for policymakers, we look at the US and efforts by the Better Identity Coalition to help US policymakers and companies shape the next generation of digital identity verification tools. Leading our discussion is Dr. Irving Gladowski Berger, a CGE fellow and former IBM Vice President of Technical Strategy and Innovation, who will introduce, introduce today's presentation. Okay, thank you, Ira, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our webinar speaker today, Jeremy Grant. Jeremy is Managing Director of Technology Business Strategy at Venable LLC, which is a company that's very involved in uh, advising uh, all kinds of institutions on the impacts of IT on cybersecurity, identity, payments, and related issues. Uh, Jeremy has a long history with identity, security, and privacy, having established the National Program Office for the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And he's the leader of organization called the Better Identity Alliance, which recently put out a report, which is one of the best reports I have seen on the subject of identity. So it's my pleasure to now uh, give you Jeremy Grant. Jeremy? Well, thank you. Good morning, Irving, and thanks, Irving and Ira, and to everybody uh, for uh, taking time to, uh, to listen to us today. Uh, so, as Irving mentioned, uh, a couple months ago, uh, the Better Identity Coalition, which is a new organization started this year, put out uh, a document called Better Identity in America, a blueprint for policymakers, and I'll be talking to you a little bit uh, about why the organization started and what we're uh, calling for today. So, uh, for starters, uh, let me give you a bit of background about the coalition. It was launched this past February as an initiative of the Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law, which is a nonprofit. Uh, dedicated to promoting uh, education and collaboration with policymakers uh, on policies related to cybersecurity. The focus was to bring together leading firms from different sectors to develop a set of consensus cross-sector policy solutions for the U.S. that could promote the development and adoption of better solutions for identity verification and authentication. So some background in terms of what drove it, and it's actually really timely we're doing this right now uh, in October. In that last year, uh, the Equifax breach, as it was announced, really started to uh, get people focusing on the implications of how we do identity, particularly when you had 145 million social security numbers that were stolen. Um, one of the concerns uh, with firms like Equifax, because we've leveraged them and their competitors for what people call knowledge-based uh, authentication, a way to do remote uh, proofing of who somebody is online by asking them a few questions about themselves, 
as it started to really raise some questions about how, how we do all of this. And this was not the first time it had been an issue. Two years before, the IRS had had a major breach uh, of these same knowledge-based questions, where, as you can see at the, the bottom of the screen, it said the hackers already had the, the answers to the questions. They had the keys. And after Equifax, we had some interesting, thing happen. uh, interesting things happen. The, the White House uh, came out uh, the same day as the former CEO of Equifax said we should replace the Social Security number. Uh, there was legislation introduced by Patrick McHenry in the House, who's one of the, uh, he's the chief deputy whip, which uh, means he's uh, one of the highest ranking Republicans that would basically ban the major credit bureaus from using American Social Security numbers for any purpose by 2020, which as far as I could tell would grind our economy to a halt in about 48 hours because nobody could get credit. And so out of that, a lot of different companies started reaching out and saying, it seems like government wants to do something. Nobody's really quite sure what's going to happen. So the coalition came together uh, when a bunch of companies who all are asking, is there an opportunity to actually try and come up with some ideas for what we should do? Um, that was you know, really the start of things. So today, our members include major financial institutions like J.P. Morgan Chase, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, PNC, Bank of America, uh, Quicken Loans, uh, the largest originator of mortgage loans in the U.S., uh, major payment card networks like Visa, MasterCard, and Discover, fintech firms like Cabbage and Onfido, Aetna on the healthcare side and vendors like Semantic, Idemia, and Equifax is actually our newest member who, um, after we published our report, said this is actually really good. This does lay out what needs to happen next. So uh, we're now uh, actually with a couple other additions coming in. I think we'll be at 18 members by the end of the year. In terms of framing the challenge, I think anybody who's you know, followed Internet Identity for a while will certainly remember this cartoon. Um, you know, 25 years ago, this was, this was cute. On the Internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, but today, not only is it still really where the challenge is, uh, but I think we're actually seeing that it's being weaponized against us. And, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, deliver proper identity online is important to a lot of different issues, including security, privacy, delivering great customer experiences, ensuring compliance with different regulations, lowering transaction costs. All of this really wraps up into one big area, which is how do you deliver trust online? And trust is something that's really hard to get right. But identity, when it's done right, and believe me, there's a lot of ways to do it wrong, and we might talk about some of that today, but when it's done right, it enables trust. Identity becomes the great enabler, providing the foundation for digital transactions and online experiences that are more secure, that are easier to use for consumers, and that can protect people's privacy. The challenge, as my old agency, uh, uh, NIST, called out a couple years ago, is that digital identity presents a real technical challenge, because the process always involves uh, proofing individuals over an open network and always involves the authentication of individual subjects over an open network. The processes and technologies that we use to establish and use digital identities offer multiple opportunities for impersonation and other attacks. Now, this has been our approach to date. I think everybody's been asked to come up with a unique security question that you'll then have to remember for the rest of your life, which, you know, has proven to be really practical, especially when you can't actually remember what uh, what the answer to a question was. I don't know about you, sometimes my preferences change. And it's especially become an issue when adversaries already know the answer. So the notion, as we'll talk about today, that your social security number is actually a secret and that only you would somehow know the last four digits of it uh, is, is quaint, uh, to say the least. On the authentication side, this hasn't worked well. I think we've all gone through different experiences where we've been told all the different rules uh, that we need to follow to create a strong password. Um, let's be clear, nobody can actually manage this for one password, let alone 20 to 30 or 80 or 120 or however many you have today. <laughs> Any password that meets this criteria actually isn't that secure because the way that uh, attackers get through isn't necessarily to try to crack your password by brute force, but instead they leverage phishing, malware with key loggers, uh, the fact that people reuse passwords across multiple sites. This is where all the bad things happen with passwords. And when you put criteria out like this, it makes your employees and your customers hate you. I think it's safe to say the password is the perfect combination of awful user experience and awful security. <laughs> so the cost of outdated identity solutions has been on display, and this is just some of the numbers we highlighted in our report. Last year in the US, there were 16.7 million victims of identity fraud. There was nearly 17 billion stolen as a result of that fraud. Uh, data breaches were up in the US nearly 45%. Uh, there were 179 million records containing personal information that were exposed in these breaches, which was a 389% increase over the previous year, and 69% of breaches were identity theft incidents. And I won't go on through all of these other than to say, um, 
there's a real problem that's out there. The other one I, I would highlight is the top right corner, 81% of our 2016 breaches um, were ones that exploited identity specifically as an attack factor, generally using weaker stolen passwords. So we've got some real challenges today. We can't just keep saying that this is a matter of inconvenience, that people don't like passwords. It's actually costing us real money and it's causing attacks that are doing real harm. So why has this been so hard to solve? Well, one of the things we talk about in our paper is what we refer to as the identity gap. Uh, essentially looking at the fact that, um, you, know, we, you know, taking a step back, a lot of times when we get into this discussion, it devolves quickly into somebody saying, well, we should have a national ID. And then three more people yell at them about it. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, the national ID discussion is not the one to be happy. We have a number of nationally recognized authoritative identity systems today. We've got the driver's license, the passport, the social security number. I've got a global entry card now since I'm overseas too much. It's not that we don't have good systems. It's that every one of them is trapped in the paper world, which means that they don't really work for the kinds of transactions we do today. So when you've got a question like this, if you were trying to open up a credit card account in the last couple of years, this was an attempt to get around the identity gap. The idea was, hey, we'll ask you what are in theory out of wallet questions that only you would know. And if you can answer a few of them correctly, hey, we, we have a, a good idea that it's probably you. Um, not everybody loved it, but <clears throat> you know, the flip side was industry needed something to enable trusted digital commerce, and this was about the best idea we had out there. And the issue now is attackers have caught up. Out of wallet questions aren't as secure as they used to be. I talked before about uh, the IRS data breach where you know, I didn't talk about it as much, but back in 2015 when they launched the Get My Transcript application, about 700,000 Americans had their information breached because the questions that they were asking turned out that had they had, the attackers already had. They weren't as secret as, uh, as they used to be. And, you know, I think there's a reason for this. Um, so it was late last year, actually, I think it was right after Thanksgiving, the House Energy and Commerce Committee held a hearing that I actually was invited to testify at. And they were looking at, you know, what has changed with Equifax and all of these other mega breaches over the last few years. And the point that they raised, and I thought it was a good one, which was you can't look at each of these breaches on their own. Um, every one of them, of course, is pretty serious. But what you're now seeing is the same malicious actors are stealing all of these big data sets, and then they're combining them into one, analyzing them, trying to figure things out, you know, building profiles on different people, which then enables them to obtain more complete packages uh, of identity information that they can use to cut through some of these knowledge-based uh, you know, first-generation solutions that we've been using for remote identity grouping. And so they were you know, really trying to, to wave a flag, to point out, we can't look at this in isolation, we've got to really look at this as more of a national issue. Among other things, social security numbers are no longer secrets. We can go on the dark web and buy them for under a dollar a piece. Uh, let's not pretend that there's really any security value of the SSN. In fact, the one thing you should assume today is that somebody's social security number has been breached multiple times. So where are we today? In an era where transactions are increasingly digital, our authoritative identity systems are stuck in the paper world. Solutions that papered over that fact helped for a while, but now attackers have caught up. Shared secrets like social security numbers and passwords are no longer secret. Industry innovation is helping to develop some better next generation identity solutions. We've seen passwordless authentication become a reality. We're seeing really interesting identity proofing tools that can scan and validate identity documents from a smartphone. But at the end of the day, government remains the one authoritative issuer of identity. And so in this next phase of making identity better, we believe that the government's going to have to have a role to play. So let's just talk about what better looks like for a minute. It really means four things to us. One, better security with less fraud and identity theft. There was a recommendation that came out uh, at the end of 2016 from, uh, there was a commission on enhancing national cybersecurity that had been set up, uh, bipartisan looking at making recommendations for the next administration. They flagged what a problem it is with identity compromise in, in cyberspace and said, we should make it a national priority that we'll take steps that compromises of identity will be eliminated as a major attack vector by 2021. That's part of what we're talking about here. It also means better convenience for consumers, allowing consumers to open new accounts online with ease without having to go through duplicative, burdensome enrollment processes. With that, we think it means better confidence for both consumers and online service providers, that the identities that are asserted online are reliable and trustworthy, and we think it means better privacy, shifting the predominant model for identity verification from one based on firms aggregating personal data without opt-in consent to one where consumers proactively request that their identity be validated by parties 
with whom they've already had a trusted relationship. So in terms of how to get there, I mentioned at the start of our discussion, in July, we released our policy blueprint that lays out five core areas where government can and should help and a specific action plan detailing who needs to do what in Congress and the executive branch. Now, to be clear, government's not the solution here, or at least not the only solution, and there isn't any single action or initiative that can solve identity. But taking as a package, we're quite confident that as policy blueprints enacted and funded, it will make identity better in America. There's five key initiatives that are in there, and I'm gonna focus just on the first two today, given time limitations. But the first is to prioritize the development of next generation remote identity proofing and verification systems. The second is to change the way America uses the social security number. The third is promote and prioritize the use of strong authentication, getting us away from passwords into things that are, are stronger and more modern. Uh, the fourth is given that uh, we're not uh, operating here alone, we need to pursue international coordination and harmonization. Many of our members are multinational companies who are dealing with these issues across the globe, and they'd like to see, uh, to the extent practical, uh, reliance on common standards, frameworks, approaches that can you know, be used uh, everywhere. And the fifth is, as we develop better identity solutions, it's going to be important to educate consumers and businesses uh, about the fact that they exist and explain to them just what it means to have better identity. So let me talk about the first one for a minute. Um, and you know, when we talk about next generation remote identity proofing systems and, and the role the government can play, in simple terms, what we're saying is if I've gone through the process of having an agency vet my identity once, could I, as a citizen, ask the agency to vouch for me when I need to prove who I am to another party? Our legacy paper-based system should be modernized around a privacy-protecting, consumer-centric model that allows consumers to ask the government agency that issued a credential to stand behind it in the online world by validating the information from the credential. And you know, to give you a real-world example of what this means, you know, I tell the story. I've, I've lived in Washington more than 20 years, but about two years ago, I had to go downtown uh, to apply for a real ID driver's license. Real ID, for those who don't know, was a law that was passed in 2005 that set some pretty firm federal standards for what state driver's licenses have to look like. Um, I will say it's been somewhat controversial and had some issues. The flip side is, if you have a real ID driver's license, you're pretty sure that person's real. And I went downtown and appeared in person in front of a government agent with my license, my passport, birth certificate, uh, my social security card, a couple pay stubs, a couple utility bills. And at the end, I got this plastic card that wasn't really different from the card I had previously. So uh, a couple months passed. My wife and I decided we wanted to take a loan out on our house to finish our basement. I've got two little kids. They're uh, lovely but loud sometimes. And we thought it'd be nice <laughs> to, to have some space for them in the basement. Went online. Found the product I wanted, it's 2017, typed everything out. I'm like, yes, we're going digital. This is going to be great. And at the end, they said, great, Mr. Grant, thanks uh, for filling that out. Your application's in order. Now can you please walk down or drive over to the nearest branch uh, so you can walk in and you can hand us that plastic card and we can look at it and look at you for about 10 seconds and then we know you're you. And my question was, why? Why is it in 2017 that, that we have to do it this way? Why is it I can't securely log in to the DMV who really knows who I am because they just saw me a few months ago and say, hey guys, can you do me a favor? Can you actually tell this bank seven things about me that they want to know so we can get on with this transaction online? And I think the answer is it's not a technology issue. In fact, that would not be hard to build at all. But from a business perspective, that's not what DMVs do. Government agencies don't provide these kinds of services. And that's the sort of thing that we think if consumers ask them to, should change. <coughs> so. Here's how this could work. You know, let's take somebody named Stacy, and who we refer to in the paper, uh, who's looking to open a bank account. So she provides her information online. They say, yeah, how do we know you're you? Here, we might actually look to bring the Social Security Administration to figure out if there really is a Stacy that's out there with her name, date of birth, and SSN. She would specifically ask, I want the government to help me prove on me online. They would push the information to her. And they would simply give a simple yes, no answer. Does this information actually exist in our databases? SSA is not sharing who she is. They're just saying, yeah, we got this record on hand. Likewise, we could do with the DMV, where again, she asked the government to help them prove it's her. They could do a simple exchange and they could you know, provide a match there. Of note, uh, while we were writing this, Congress passed uh, what's commonly known as the Bank Reg Reform uh, Bill back in May, uh, S2155. It's actually directing the Social Security Administration to establish this very service for any uh, financial service transactions that are covered under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Our view is this is a great start. We're actually having discussions with SSA on 
uh, you know, ideas around, you know, how to best implement it. But we think it should be expanded beyond just um, what's out there, and that is a consumer from the FCRA side, and that is a consumer. Um, why do I really care, you know, if, if a transaction where I'm trying to prove I'm me is covered under a particular law or not? The other way that this could work, and I think this is starting to look to the next generation, is apps that would enable consumers to easily prove their identity. So then we'll take Stacy. Now she's going to the water department this time, just to mix it up. She provides her information. They say, we have no idea if you're really you. Now, she requests that the government helps her, uh, her prove who she is. Um, we'll use the DMV here. We're going to introduce the concept of a mobile driver's license app, which would be an app on her phone that was you know, issued uh, to her phone at the time the credential was issued, so there's a secure cryptographic connection between them. She would log in locally to the device. The device would then pass a cryptographic key to the DMV, authorizing the sharing of information or the matching of information. It's a little bit of a different approach that, among other things, also makes you understand that the person who's holding the phone is actually the person to whom it was issued. Gives you a little bit of a higher level of assurance. And here, this is actually something going back to the commission report that this was specifically called out uh, that the government should serve as a source to validate identity attributes to address identity uh, challenges online. And they specifically flagged the role of the DMVs, among other things. So there is some policy precedent for this. We do think, however, privacy is you know, an important question. In fact, this came up. Uh, before the call when Irving was asking about, well, you know, what are, what is a militia, you know, uh, you know, going to say about this? Um, you know, look, when it comes to privacy, let's state up front that the fact that we don't have good identity solutions is impacting the privacy of millions of Americans today. We've had an epidemic of breaches, and if we can get better identity, it's key to improving protections. But we think we need to go beyond that. We think government needs to embrace a privacy by design approach for these new systems to ensure that any things that we're putting out there is architected from the start to address privacy risks. The solutions really need to embed it, be embedded, uh, uh, protections need to be embedded in the architecture. We think there should only be a, a situation where government would validate data if the consumer affirmatively requests it and only for the purpose specified. We think consumers should be able to choose to share or validate only certain attributes about themselves without revealing all of their identifying data. And so with all of this, we think uh, that if we really want to make sure systems are secure and privacy preserving, NIST should be funded to lead development of a framework of both standards and operating rules that would apply to any new government-driven attribute validation services. That would ensure consistency across the 50 states and set a high bar from the start to make sure bad things don't happen. Uh, we you know, talk about states and the role of the DMV. We think they're really in a good position to drive this today, uh, you know, in part because uh, thanks to the Real ID Act, the driver's license is backed by a very robust enforcement identity proofing process. One challenge is that state DMV systems aren't really built to support modern identity services. I think this is uh, perhaps a bit of an exaggeration. There's a lot of states running DMVs off infrastructure that's 20 to 30 years old, and states aren't incented to invest on their own in modernization to support digital identity. So this is one area where we've suggested that the government should step in. Uh, we did an analysis of recent DMV modernizations and you know what the average cost tends to be. There haven't been many. Uh, we think there's somewhere between two and a half and three billion dollars in um, um, unaddressed funding needs right now for DMV modernization. Um, and so here we're calling for a new uh, grant program of 200 million a year over five years to put some seed money into the states to help incentivize them to take this step. Uh, we do think it's important though that you know, with the federal grant dollars, uh, you can only spend it if you're following this new NIST framework. I think there needs to be some strings attached to make sure that we're funding programs that prioritize best practices for security and privacy. <laughs> And we I, I'll skip through the next slide real quick. Other than we think there's more work needed in uh, R&D and standards as well. We're, we're running a little uh, short on time. And I want to just make a, take a couple minutes to also talk about the way uh, we think we need to change the way we use the social security number in the country. So, you know, I mentioned at the beginning after the Equifax breach, we saw some proposals. Let's replace it with something new. Let's ban people from using it in certain ways. Um, our take is there's some things that you're overlooking here which is that you can't talk about the social security number as just one thing. It's really two. So the first thing the SSN is, is an identifier. So if I Google myself, uh, Jeremy Grant, uh, you'll see there's a lot of different uh, folks who pop up, including one guy who's a power forward in the NBA who doesn't even spell his name the same way as me, J-E-R-A-M-I, <laughs> which has a whole discussion for another webinar another time. But there's only one that's me. So the SSN is an identifier, and that, that, that's how it was created. You know, so for all the different Jeremy Grants that are out there, which one is me? Only one, hopefully, has my social security number. And identifiers you know, are often a username or number. Uh, they don't have to be secret. In fact, a lot of them are widely known. Uh, 
Um, and, and that's okay. You know, I look at my Twitter handles at jgrant from DC. Uh, my email address is jeremy.grant at venable.com. Those aren't secrets. They're identifiers that are out there. So, in fact, one thing we get into trouble with is when we start pretending that identifiers are secret, should be kept secret, which is an area we've, we've gotten into trouble with the SSN. With that, the second thing the SSN is, is an authenticator used to determine whether a person is actually claiming to be a particular individual is in fact that person. And that's usually something that a person possesses or controls, such as a password, a biometric, a cryptographic key. It should not be widely known. So from our perspective, we think it's really important to frame proposals about the future of the SSN on the basis of its use as an authenticator or as an identifier or both. But it's really important when we talk about restricting the use of it or replacing it, what do you mean? You want to replace it as an authenticator or as an identifier. As an authenticator, the social security number absolutely needs to be replaced. Let's face it, it's, it's useless. The idea that it's still a secret is a fallacy. However, as an identifier, identifiers can be publicly known. And we think because it's so embedded in so many different systems across the U.S., we'll actually need to preserve its use as an identifier. Not to say we don't look to reduce its use wherever feasible, but if you start to take away the security value from the social security number, uh, it's uh, the, you know, the issues uh, involved with replacing it get to be much more significant than simply uh, modernizing our approach to it. So, you know, to that extent, we specifically come out in the paper and say, look, let's not look to replace the social security number with a new government issued identifier. The end result of this would be that you cost, you spend billions of dollars, you'd create confusion for hundreds of millions of Americans as they try to figure out this new number versus this old number and how to manage it. Uh, and don't even start talking to me about, well, what if it was some revocable cryptographic thing tied to the blockchain? Because that'll confuse people even more in terms of how they actually access it and manage it. Uh, at the end of the day, you'd spend a lot of money, confuse people, and not get much security benefit. Plus, any new identifier would require both the government and industry to map it back to the old social security number. So you think about the chaos with errors and mapping and matching and whatnot, you know, we'd have some real issues. We do think, though, it would make sense to have an executive order or legislation that would ban agencies from using the social security number as an authenticator. Uh, because um, there's so many laws and regulations that actually require different sectors to collect the SSN and retain it. Uh, we think a task force should be launched to review those and see whether any could be changed. And finally, we think it's important to acknowledge the role that the Social Security Administration itself plays in the identity ecosystem. Because for years the message has been, this isn't really their issue, they just give you a number, but their real job is to administer delivery benefits, which is true, but at this point, they play a really significant role. And I think just trying to change that discussion to recognize that they also you know, are the ones who issue what is the de facto identifier in the US. Uh, and then take a step back and start to think about what that might mean. Uh, that I think you know, can help move us forward significantly. So with that, I've been talking quite a bit and I wanna to get to the webinar portion. So I'm gonna stop the share and we'll go back to uh, the webinar itself and I look forward to the discussion. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jeremy, for that excellent presentation where you cover a lot of material very clearly, and uh, that's why you were able to cover so much material. Let me ask any of the participants, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A uh, link at the bottom of the screen, and then you can enter your question. Jeremy, let me first ask you, uh, when, uh, you know, MIT has a number of secure websites, and to log into them, I can either use my MIT ID and a password, or I can log in with my digital certificate, which I mm -hmm. have in all my laptops and my mobile device, and the digital certificate recognizes the, I guess, the browser and device, and then it's linked to an application called Duo Mobile in my mm -hmm. mobile device. So is that a much safer way of logging in than the usual password route? Um, yes, absolutely. And in fact, as you're mentioning what MIT has been doing with Duo, that was actually funded by one of the original NSTIC pilots that we launched back in 2012. Uh, we funded Internet2, uh, who you know, is essentially a consortium of different folks in the academic space to look to drive better authentication security uh, through the partnership that they had launched uh, with Duo. And so 
Yeah, it's a much better way because it's, you know, depending on how it's used, it can either be used uh, as a standalone or as a second factor on top of a password. Um, but yes, you're, you're, you're suddenly, look, anytime you're adding a second layer on, that's better. I think one challenge we have seen in the last five years with the push to multi-factor authentication is that some of the solutions we've been pushing out can also be fished. And so one issue we've seen, whether it's SMS text that we're using or also push notifications, is depending on how they're being used, uh, those can be fishable uh, because you might, you know, let's say, uh, you know, you could be tricked through, you know, clicking on a, on a link in a spear phishing attack, enter your username and password, great, hey, we know you've got uh, mobile uh, authentication set up, so they will enter your username and password into the real site while you're in the phishing site, you'll get the push notification and uh, say, oh, you're trying to log in, Irvin, oh, yeah, sure, thanks, and when you do that, you're automating them taking over your account. Now, there are ways to mitigate that, and so, I, you know, without getting too much into the, all the details, I'll say the one thing that we're seeing these days is, and Javelin Research talked about this a year ago, it needs to push more towards what they call high assurance strong authentication, uh, leveraging some sort of public-private key pairs that aren't fishable. So, mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot, you know, about the work the FIDO Alliance has done. In fact, we talk about that quite a bit in our paper. As an industry standard, where you have Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, other big platform players all working together to ensure uh, that you have unfishable strong authentication, usually leveraging biometrics as a first um, factor just locally on the device, never central, to then unlock a certificate that then can log you in. Okay, uh, very good. Um, let's see, one question that I also have, um, you know, like, uh, a month ago, we had a, a presentation by Aris Sharma, who one of the leaders of India's Adhar Initiative, and as you know so well, that was very much a government-led initiative. And yes. I, I really like your recommendation that since government, especially uh, the IRS, government agencies, the IRS and the various DMVs have so much of our personal data, they should be comfortable being authenticators. That's all you're asking them to do. Why are they so, why are the government agencies so reluctant to get involved in authentication in any way, shape, or form? So I don't know that they're reluctant. I'd say they've never been asked to formally. Um, I mean, look, if you talk to the DMVs, they're, you know, they're, they're absolutely correct in saying the reason that DMVs are established is to issue driver's licenses, which, you know, authorizes you to operate a motor vehicle. They've never been told by the governors of the state legislatures that identity is going to be a mission for them. Likewise, the SSA, you know, Congress, if you go see the House Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Finance Committee that oversees them, they will say, this is not their mission. Part of what we're arguing is, in 2018, things have changed. It needs to become part of that. Or somebody's got to do it, because industry is not going to solve it alone. But, but Jeremy, as you said before, so tomorrow I'm flying to Nashville to get on the plane. I have to show, not just to get on the plane, to get past security, I have to show my driver's license. Yes. Now, so whatever uh, I, I, yeah. that that's not their mission, they have become a de facto proof that I am yeah, that's who I the am. Point we, right. And I think that's the point we make as well is, again, you know, I mentioned earlier the discussion of the national ID card, I think, is, is the wrong discussion. It's, it's not something we need in the U.S. Uh, nobody's calling for it. What no, we need right. are ways to leverage the authoritative identity systems that we have in the ways that we all transact business, which is increasingly digital. And so I think that's really the, you know, one of the crux of that argument in our paper is it's time to transform the mission. It's time to transform the way that the entities that do deliver credentials deliver them through, you know, ways that you can actually leverage these plastic and paper things online. And that's the that I think is starting to, uh, to resonate. Yeah, but Jeremy, I mean, I don't need to tell you that. There are lots of smart people in the Department of Commerce in NIST, where you were a member of. There are a lot of smart people in OSTP, Office of Science and Technology. So 
So when you say, well, nobody asked them, usually they are the people who set up the strategies for the country. They don't need to be asked. So sure. why in this case are they so reluctant? Something must be going on that makes them reluctant to act, to act uh, when it comes uh, to identity. Uh, well, so a couple things on that. Um, one, you know, if, one way this is different from NSIC, which was drafted in 2010 and released in 2011, was NSIC had the view that the private sector could largely drive this, that we would just be able to have private sector identity providers that would somehow get certified and be able to, um, um, you know, be accepted everywhere, including by government. And I think one thing that we've seen, given the attacks on the private sector identity services that have been set up uh, that weren't leveraging government information is, the government's going to need to play a role. I think that's one real way in which this strategy differs from, from the NSIC from a couple of years ago. I think there's, so I'll say, look, I, we've been having a lot of conversations. There's been great interest in our paper since it came out. Um, I will say what might seem obvious to you or I was not necessarily obvious to a lot of other people, but the good news is, as we've had discussions with different policymakers and other stakeholders, um, as we presented it, they've said, this does make a lot of sense, and we should give these ideas consideration. But as you know, in government, everything takes some time. So I think that's no. um, what we're dealing with right now. But I am, um, I would say, cautiously optimistic. Uh, the fact the Social Security Administration was directed by Congress to set up an attribute validation service this spring, and they're working on it now, I think is a positive sign. Uh, from our perspective, we want to see them do this really, really well and have it be a smashing success because we think it can provide a template for what other um, other agencies can do at different levels of government. Yeah, you know, what, one of the recommendations I saw for uh, identity certification was actually in an excellent paper by the World Economic Forum two years ago, led yes. by uh, Jesse McMaster, who is actually going to be our next webinar speaker on December Excellent. 6th. And what the World Economic Forum recommended is the notion of identity service providers that establish an ecosystem of partners, most of them from the private sector, but it could involve IRS and DMVs, to together certify identities. Now, um, that hasn't happened. We don't have the notion of private sector-led identity service providers. I was uh, 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 consulting with MasterCard until a couple of years ago, and I asked our CEO, who's excellent, why haven't we done that? Because he was very supportive. And he said, unlimited liability, that mm -hmm. uh, nobody, you know, nobody is going to sign up to certify identities if there is unlimited liability. Uh, is that a correct issue here? And, and whose so, job is it to change that? So you mentioned before at the beginning of our discussion that I work in Venable, which is a law firm with the largest privacy and cybersecurity legal practice in the country, though I'm not a lawyer. Um, it's a bit of a leading question that you gave me and that I'll say, there's a reason I joined a law firm a year and a half ago. It's that I think this is a very important issue to advancing digital identity. Um, and separate from the work I do leading the coalition, we're involved right now with a couple of clients trying to bring some new thinking on the legal side to this very issue. <clears throat> so I will say there are good examples in different parts of the world where you do have a private sector ecosystem. Look, globally, you have the Kantara Initiative, which actually certifies, uh, has a certification scheme to look at private sector identity providers um, that you know, in theory lays out the way that you could, you know, have strong federation. Uh, the problem, frankly, is that there have not been enough online service providers who have been willing to adopt it. And so um, it's, it's there, but, you know, the proof's in the pudding in terms of the number of users that you have. And so, you know, I think actually Kantara has done great work that might provide a foundation for how we go forward, but it's good to look at some new approaches as well. I think from my perspective, Liability issues 15 years ago that derailed some of the first attempts by banks and others to do this aren't necessarily the same today in that we've got a lot more agreements in place for inter-party data exchange. 
And at the end of the day, identity information isn't necessarily that different from the rest of it. So um, without getting into too many details, I can say we're involved in a couple of projects right now with a consortium of major players in different industries um, where we're you know, trying to take, you know, bring some fresh thinking on the liability side. I think it can be overcome. I honestly think some of the liability excuses have been, or the liability issues have been excuses from parties who just don't want to find a way to federate and cooperate. And so now that we've advanced the discussion a little bit more over the last few years, I, I think we're in a better position to you know, start to get some real uh, um, uh, you know, true federated systems up and running. You know, so for example, I noticed that both uh, MasterCard and Visa are members of the Better Identity Coalition, and yes. they already work with many banks and other institutions in managing, you know, credit card approvals and risk management and things like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the organizations like that seem like a natural because they already know how to do it. Plus, they are already regulated. So, yes. any issues like we don't like to be regulated. Listen, identity by definition is going to be regulated. I, I, I period. Just like yeah. my birth certificate has to be produced by in, by a regulated government agency. I, I don't know who it is, but so why haven't those are, and do, do you think there is a good probability that they will step up to the plate? Because this is a revenue source from them. Nobody said that when they certify an identity, they don't get paid. So this is a good yeah. revenue source. So I, I'm actually really optimistic about what we're going to see from the private sector in that right now I'm seeing, uh, one, a consortium of major financial institutions look to, to build this with some real serious resources behind it. Um, second, same thing happening in the healthcare space with patient identity, a lot of big players coming together. And third, the mobile network operators uh, recently had an announcement around what they call Project Verify. Um, in, in, some, in, in some ways, it's been... Um, Heartening to see is, you know, a guy who back in 2011 when we launched NSTIC, those were all parties it was hard to get to the table. And I think um, the part of it might be I was calling and saying, hey, we're from the government, we're here to help. <laughs> um, but also, um, you know, it was a strategy that was a little bit ahead of its time in terms of where the market yeah. actually was. And I think what I'm seeing in 2018 is all of those industries and others have recognized um, how important digital identity is. Um, that they can really reduce their risk, that they can find ways to offer new products in the space. And there might be a revenue stream, as you notice. Um, you know, yeah. I, I've long said, when I look at identity, what's the most important thing? And, you know, hearkening back to the graduates, um, validated attributes are the new plastics. Yeah, exactly. And entities that have them, uh, which include some of the entities I mentioned outside of government, uh, if they can come up with the right structure, are able to monetize those in a way that, um, well, you know, is certainly nice for the bottom line, but also can help them deliver new services. So, you know, all of this could crash and burn, of course, all things always can. It is complicated, but there's a lot of interest and, again, a lot of new thinking coming in. You know, the, the one thing I'll say is while things didn't work the first or second time we tried to do this, everybody learned from why they didn't work. And yeah, no, I think no, that's, that's an important thing is that, yeah, just, just because an initiative didn't uh, didn't transform identity doesn't mean that we didn't learn what we had to do the next time around. No, no, I understand. I mean, I like to remind people the Surgeon General's report on cigarettes came out 1950s or 1960s, and it wasn't until the 1990s that yes. something happened. So, so now we have some questions from uh, participants. Here is a question from Segun Adekoya. Why can't we just use biometrics as an authenticator leveraging the secure mobile platforms that everybody uses? So we can, and in fact, I mentioned the FIDO standard before, that, that's exactly what that is. But I wanna make sure we separate things between authentication which is essentially proving that you're really Irving on the other end of the transaction when you're logging in the second time, and identity proofing, which is when you're looking to an established account to prove that you're really who you claim to be that first time. And so uh, the biometrics on the devices, I don't think do much 
for uh, identity proofing other than some apps where I'll take my phone, scan my driver's license, take a selfie or a quick little video, they'll do a face recognition match, uh, and then you can prove, hey, if this guy's really holding the license uh, and the face matches, yeah, we, this is probably him. Although I'll say the companies in that space, you know, some of them are members of our coalition. They think we need to go further to go to the, the databases and the government to validate the attributes as well. But on the authentication side, the great thing about the FIDO Alliance standards is, you know, I'm doing this webinar on a Windows machine. I've got an Android phone uh, downstairs that I use for one application. I'm making this call for my iPhone. They're all architected the same. These devices have some really interesting features, which is a number of biometric sensors, fingerprint, face, iris, voice, mm -hmm. uh, and they all have a secure element, a trusted execution environment, mm -hmm. a CPM mm -hmm. chip that's in the, uh, where, where I can uh, basically protect the biometric and also generate and apply cryptographic keys. And so, you know, FIDO is essentially, you know, the two-step of one, local authentication to your device, generally with a biometric, but could be something else like a PIN, and then that unlocks a cryptographic key that's used to log you in. And so, in fact, I think next week at a forum we're putting on in their offices in D.C. on November 2nd, they'll have Microsoft and Google showing how you could use an Android phone to log into your Windows machine uh, or vice versa. Um, you know, ways you can use things like Windows Hello with the biometric feature and FIDO mm -hmm. standards to log into a website with your face without ever having to type a password. We're, we're close to the post-password world. It's happening today. I think you're going to see a lot of other... Uh, adoptions uh, rolling out uh, over the next year now that you know most of the standards work has been done and so I'm actually we, we focus a lot less on authentication in our paper in part because our view is industries made some good steps to solve it and I want to say industry you know we've had governments from around the world at the table at the FIDO Alliance as well who've been participating so we're mm -hmm. we're closer to solving that problem authentication is getting easier it's the identity proofing that's getting harder listen uh, your your Positivity is very heartening here. Uh, Segway had another question. Actually, Irving, I would like to ask a question of Jeremy. Jeremy, it's Ira. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what kind of reception you're getting beyond um, your members are mostly in the financial services, healthcare, you know, industries where the CEOs are used to dealing with sensitive data and, and yeah. certainly interacting with consumers in that regard. I'm curious what kind of reaction and understanding of this issue, because it's really an issue that cuts across industries. Do you get that kind of understanding um, in connection with CEOs of other companies and other industries? Do they really understand this issue or are they sort of um, position it as something that their IT, their computer, their computer cert, uh, security experts should handle? Uh, is there a recognition among CEOs that this is something that really needs to be deal with, dealt with? You know, I'd say it's evolving. So it's getting better every year. Um, okay. Look, I'll say when we launched this this coalition, we weren't necessarily looking to have it be so heavy, heavy in terms of financial services. But I think one thing we're seeing right now is that industry is acutely focused on this more than other sectors because they're feeling the pain uh, more directly. I mean, I, I just got, I mentioned you know, before we started the call, I got back real late last night from Las Vegas. I was out at the Money 2020 conference. That's an oh, identity yeah. conference these days because yeah. everything you want to do with the future of payments in FinTech depends yeah. on knowing whether somebody's a dog at the other end of the transaction. Exactly. Um, and so I think given, you know, the trends we've seen in that particular sector over the last three or four years, yes, there's nobody in financial services uh, who, if not at the CEO level, at least at a pretty high strategic level, is focused on this. Healthcare as well, I think they're getting there. Um, in part in the U.S., there's you know, some new rules coming out from the Department of Health and Human Services around the next generation of how we do digital health that make identity a real priority. Um, you know, other sectors, you know, retail or you know, you know, what I call you know, tech giants are, are focused on this somewhat, but you know, they're, they're focused where they have pain points. Certainly authentication is a pain point. Nobody likes putting consumers through password processes. And, um, you know, as I mentioned with things like FIDO, a lot of the tech giants are, you know, really making it a priority uh, to get the on passwords. But, you know, I, I think a lot of it really depends on where are you running into problems. And so uh, it, it's been a little bit mixed. I, I can't say we've talked to any companies where they've said, you're not focusing on something that's important. We don't like the approach you've taken. But, you know, you, you get attention where industries are, you know, dealing with something that's, you know, much more acute. And Jeremy, one question that I've had is 
in a mature industry, let's take civil engineering. You know, that mm -hmm. engineering has been around for a long time. If, if a building collapses or something happens to it, and upon investigation, you find out that the contractors knowingly didn't use good materials, they are open to gigantic civil or even criminal liabilities, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how far are we from a time where if I'm interacting with a retailer and somehow my identity gets stolen, data gets stolen, I mean, remember we've had issues, was it Target that had a gigantic breach years ago? Mm -hmm. And uh, what if over time you start holding the company, not the CIO, but the company, like you would a civil engineering, accountable for any breaches if upon investigation you find out that there were things they could have done that they didn't do? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you imagine getting to that point? I, I'd say we're already there. You know, Target, you know, their CEO and a lot of other folks got replaced in the wake of that breach. Same thing with Equifax. Uh, and I'll tell you, every, you know, not that it's good to see that happen, but one thing that I think, you know, some of the breaches of a few years ago did was started to get um, board attention and C-level executive attention on managing cyber risk uh, to the point that, um, look, a lot of the, you know, the, the work we do outside of the coalition is also focused on, you know, trying to help different companies uh, manage cyber risk. And, you know, the fact that these are now C-level and boardroom conversations, the fact that many boards now have uh, a cybersecurity element to, you know, their, their risk committee, uh, I think is, is quite important. So I think, look, between existing regulators, uh, where the FTC is coming after breaches, and especially, hey, you watch one of your peers get fired, that's a, a good message that you might need to start taking this seriously. Um, I How still do think there action? is. What's have, that? You class act, have you seen class action lawsuits uh, based on, you know, uh, again, you work in a law company, so are there yes. class action lawsuits if, if enough people lose data and are hurt by identity theft and so on? Has that oh, I, happened? I don't think there's. I don't think there's been a major breach where there hasn't been a class action lawsuit. And in fact, sometimes you'll even see a lawsuit filed if there's just a, a report of something and you don't actually know what happened. Um, so I, I do think that companies have plenty of incentives. Although, look, the flip side is a lot of them take this as a risk equation and say, well, what's the cost of defending and paying a class action lawsuit versus investing? Now, by the way, from my perspective, that's the wrong discussion to have. It really should be focusing on how you can ensure your enterprise and your customer data is secure. But it's taking time, I think, for companies across no, no, different sectors to wake I up mean, to that. If you, if you are a building contractor, you cannot say what's the value of using less, uh, you know, steel that is under regulation right. because that's criminally that's criminal negligence, correct? Yes, I, I think the one thing that's different with cyber risk, though, is the threat vectors are constantly changing. And so it's, you know, building codes are pretty strong. We've got standards there. It's, you know, pretty, you know, cut and dry. Either you, you, you built the code or you didn't. And I think one of the challenges with mitigating cyber risk is that the attack vectors are constantly changing. So you might implement something that you think is secure and two years later, it's not. I, Jeremy, I, this is my opinion. That's because civil engineering, mechanical engineering, when it comes to car and airplane, they've been around for a hundred years. So, so these things have evolved. I am just about positive that this will be the case a few decades from now in the world of digital infrastructures because it's so prevalent. I mean, I cannot imagine the the digital economy continuing to advance unless something like that happens. Is that correct thinking? Well, I hope that's the case, but I'll, I'll give you a, a much darker future, or at least, you know, 
uh, frightening because of the unknown. So I, I was just uh, just finished the book, uh, science fiction book on a long flight to Singapore and back that I had called Void Star, where one of the themes in there is you, you know, 50 years in the future, you have these massive artificial intelligence entities that are launching on their own very sophisticated attacks against systems. And you have other AIs here to try and react to what they're doing and defend against them. And so it's literally a battle between AIs that are out there uh, all trying to uh, get supremacy. And we're already, you know, it's funny, we see this now, if you go, you know, walk the floor at the RSA conference or other cybersecurity shows, lots of new products leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to try and anticipate what, it, what an attacker might do, react on the fly and make decisions. Well, guess what? The attackers are going to use that tool as well. So um, I hope we're, that, that's not our future, but it's at least one possibility. The humans are accountable, in my opinion. So, Ira, do you have any uh, questions? Uh, yeah, I'm curious, and this I think Sigun uh, also brought this up. Um, one of the things uh, in our discussion uh, of the Adhar program was the recognition that they have saved uh, billions of dollars through their national mm -hmm. identity system, cutting a lot of uh, waste and corruption. That is, is that possible with the um, the blueprint you're putting forth? It's not something that you. Oh yeah. Uh, so well, talk a little bit about about how that could apply to the U.S. system and U.S. policymakers, how they would apply that. Well, I'll say when I was in government, we actually funded a big study that we did jointly with the Internal Revenue Service, looking at that very topic. Um, because one of the questions came up, you know, hey, if we actually have digital identity, um, what, what can we save? And so we brought in uh, a, you know, a group of economists uh, from a nonprofit and you know, started to basically pick apart what does it cost the IRS when you show up in person? What does it call them to deal with a call? Uh, what does it call if you mail cost when you mail something into them? And what would the cost be digitally? And the answer was that if there was a vibrant identity ecosystem, the IRS alone would probably save around three hundred million dollars a year. That was a high end. It was a range, I think, from like a hundred to three hundred. But real cost savings if you can enable uh, new online transactions because you have digital identity. And so, you know, the issue we have today is that there's a lot of transactions, be they in government or industry, that aren't online, like that loan I was trying to take out last year, simply because of the fact that the risk model is such that we're not going to allow you to do it online because we don't know who you are, at least not at the right level of assurance. So I think there's real savings that are out there. Uh, it's not just about better security, better trust, better convenience. Um, everybody wants to do digital commerce for a reason. It costs a lot less. Yeah. And, but, you know, and one of the questions we ask was couldn't authentication be a revenue source for authenticators like the IRS and the DMVs because it's a small micropayment for each authentication, but if you do billions of small micropayments, after a while it begins to look like real money. Has that yeah. been looked well, at? Well, at a minimum, I think one thing that's emerged is that any new services that the agencies are going to stand up for the private sector to ping, the private sector will pay for. So I mentioned before, Congress back in May told the Social Security Administration to set up an attribute validation service. They also stated that industry will have to pay for it and that work will not start on it until the SSA actually collects 50% of the cost. And Perfect. industry's view is, that's fine. We're paying commercial providers for this right, right now. And if we, you can give us better data more accurate data, we're happy to pay for this as well. Now, separately, logistics of trying to figure out what the cost will be uh, and what the volume will be turns out to be quite confusing, uh, but we're working through that right now. So no, I, I think this is an area where, if not as a profit center, they will at least be able to develop cost reimbursable services. And certainly in the private sector, there's hundreds of companies that sell this stuff today. Great. Hey, Jeremy, I'm going to ask one last question. Um, I loved your slide on the passwords. Uh, we all go through that. Uh, I know I have a list of uh, written down all my passwords. Uh, <laughs> in a nice, secure place right on my desk. Um, do, which do, is you remember, not, do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, get a password manager. I know that. I realize that. Certainly not the best practice. But I'm, I'm curious, what does the world look like for the consumer? when we have identity author authorization and verification systems? Is it a pain-free world? 
Well, I don't, it, it's, it certainly has less pain. Look, one, I really think we're on the cusp of the post-password world right now on the authentication side with things like FIDO standards and other, other solutions taking hold that leverage a combination of local match biometrics and uh, you know, device identification and certificates on them. Um, and I think you know, you always are going to have a little bit of friction when you're doing account opening, but it's not hard to envision uh, a world a couple years from now where rather than show my license to the bank in person, I have a you know, mobile license that's stored securely on here somehow, we could talk about different models, that when I'm applying for an account online or I'm looking to do checkout somewhere, it's really easy for me to assert those government-backed uh, uh, identity attributes about me. Again, it's not a technology challenge. It's really a question of just changing some of the models that, that identity service uh, providers offer to me. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, actually. Uh, so, you know, what, one closing comment. When we pulled this coalition together, one of the thoughts was, let's not try to rewrite NSIC. Let's not come up with a pie-in-the-sky world of what things should look like in 10 years. Let's try to actually look at things that we could accomplish over the next two or three years that would make a material difference. So one question we get a lot is, well, you didn't solve this problem, or you didn't solve that problem in the blueprint. And the answer is absolutely. We, we, we're not the solve every problem in Identity Coalition. We're the better Identity Coalition. If we do these five things, we can make things better. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been wonderful. Great, uh, great presentation. Thank you for your time, Jeremy, and uh, thank all our viewers. Uh, if you would like to listen to this uh, recording, it'll be available on our uh, YouTube channel. And everybody, I don't know if you want to add any uh, closing comments. I just want to thank Jeremy for a wonderful presentation and a wonderful discussion. Uh, Thanks. Well, I appreciate you all hosting this today. This was a great talk. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thanks.